I'd like to look back to the time when uh, Donald Ross first came to Exmoor. As best we know, it was 1914 or 1915. Yeah. And uh, I've been told that golf architecture, good golf architecture, begins with the land. What do you think Mr. Ross thought of this site, this property, when he first came here? Well, I think, you know, it's, in some ways it was uh, different than, than most of the, the, the courses on the East Coast. You know, there's, there's a lot more topographic personality, you know. So the flatness of it probably is, was difficult for him in some ways. You know, it didn't, um, the land was probably wide open, almost completely barren of trees. But um, I think, I think probably with, with a challenge for him in some ways, you know, I mean, there was much, nature didn't help him enough, so he really had to work with, from experience, very, mm -hmm. had to be quite creative, his bunkering and so forth, but, um, so I, I think, I think he would have preferred land with more topography, the one, the, the, the great thing here, which of course you see in a lot of his golf courses, it's, I mean, this is sort of this to me is sort of a man's course. I don't mean that in the wrong way, but uh, you know it's a big, it's a pretty big, bold golf course with plenty of room separating fairways, and so in that sense, pretty spectacular. Mm -hmm. We don't have many photographs from that that era, but the ones we've seen in the early '30s show a course with spectacular style. It seems like the course had really matured at that time. Uh, do you think he was pleased with what what happened here at Exmoor? I think so. I think Willie, Willie Willie Watson had a lot to do with the construction of it. Am I right or am I wrong? No, we don't know his name. Okay, he did a lot of construction in this area. Um, I I should know his exact history, but I just can't recall it all. But to be honest, but some of the bunkering, for example, some of the bunker with all these multiple fingers and things is definitely not. A, a Ross characteristic, you know, and I would think I would say that it has more to do with Willie Watson because I've seen other work of his. Mm -hmm. I, I'm making a guess that he did the construction, you know, but um, I would say Ross, you know, looking looking at the golf course today, which I feel pretty much represents what he what he was seeking. I would say I would say he'd be pretty happy. Mm -hmm. Would have been very happy with it. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at that time, 1915, 1916, he pretty much was all by himself. He just was starting to build a team of other associates. So, you know, he was under a lot of pressure, getting very popular, and it was a time of strictly automobile and rail traffic, rail mm -hmm. travel. You know, so. Right. Um, he didn't have a chance. They, they, it, it wasn't normal that an architect would spend a lot of time getting the golf course built. They just didn't, they didn't think the way they do today. Mm -hmm. Did his architectural talents evolve and his style change after that period of time, uh, up until his death in the 1940s? Sure, it did. I mean, he, in the beginning, it was very primitive. There were many squarish greens, which of course 18 really is right here you know but uh, the putting surface is very square but um, most of the greens were, that were not very well defended by bunkers wrapping around the corners th mm -hmm. things like that but yeah he, he definitely he definitely changed over the years for the better in your view I think so I, I think so in many respects but um, I don't think that I don't think that diminishes the quality of his work at this time. Mm -hmm. The work really 15 years earlier than this or 12 years earlier than this was way more simple than what you see here. Oh yeah. Would you say he added uh, a strategic, strategic elements to the golf course that we didn't have before? I think he did on, on just about every golf course he really added a lot of strategy. I mean, he had a very unique perspective on on golf and the strategy and architecture. In, in, in my opinion, no one has been as equal since that time. What's, what's, what I find unusual is nobody really, nobody seems to understand him enough to copy his, 
his work. But could, could you delve a little deeper into some of those strategic uh, design aspects, maybe one or two examples that are typical of his courses? Yeah, a, lot, a, a, a big part of it is the bunkering. You know, the, there's, a, there's a randomness about his bunkering. He basically, if you really study Ross's work, uh, one of the interesting characteristics of Ross is you, you, you never find any, that he put a par on any hole on any golf course he ever designed. And he had never established a par on the golf course. In essence, he felt like everybody should play the entire golf course. Mm -hmm. There wasn't, that we didn't have four and five sets of teeing blocks. So he felt like men, women, seniors, really talented players, in essence, should play the entire golf course. And he went to his grave with that kind of an, uh, of an opinion. Do you mean with, with one set of tees per hole? One set of blocks. I right, see. right. So just play golf. Just play golf. He, he didn't, there was no par really established. It was just, um, a wonderful variety of tests, mm -hmm. hole by hole, you know. Uh, but, and so consequently, some of the bunkering may be only 85 yards in front of a tee or 300 yards in front of the tee. He realized that that, the, that initial bunker was was only a test from a, from a skill standpoint for the, 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 the players who were the, with the least strength um, but it all, and on, in, in, in other ways, it sort of established the beginning of the hole and created a certain amount of delight for the people that carried that hazard. Other hazards were played. Basically, and his, his bunkering was, was really a matter of, of reading the ground. It wasn't, there, was, there was no mathematical uh, characteristics to where he placed bunkers. Mm -hmm. It wasn't placed only to challenge the best golfers. Now his green complexes, much like Exmoor today, are large, sloping, have uh, roll-offs on the back. Well, what are the origins of that design feature for Ross? Probably Dornock is the best example where he lived and grew up. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was 1891 that old Tom Morris came to Dornock where, and Donald at the time was 13 years old. I think he was born in 1872, so 11, 12, 13 years old. and. Um, you know, he was a was a capable player as a as a young man. I don't mm -hmm. know how well he played at that young age, but he he was there to witness old Tom stretching the golf course, adding nine holes. Um, so Dornick had a big impression on him, and I think um, I I think his best work is still hints of of Dornick. Mm -hmm. That of course his experience at St Andrews before he came to America. <clears throat> His experience at St. Andrews, how he he was he actually uh, when his education was as an apprentice carpenter, <clears throat> and he went to St. Andrews to be a club maker with Robert Forgan, a very notable club maker at the mm -hmm. time, but was a good player. And just by chance, he happened to be at St. Andrews when some of the great characters of the history of the game were there, old Tom and and Albert, uh, not, uh, Alan Robertson had passed away, but. You know some of the really noticeable people, and of course, uh, John Sutherland at Dornock was a big influence. He was a mm -hmm. he, he was sort of the general manager of Dornock at the time, um, so he came under some unique influences. He was a good player, and he, he just had an extra spark about him intellectually. Yeah, R Ron, with so much of your architectural practice focused on renovating Ross courses, you must feel something about him uh, you must know feel that you know him i do I, I think you know people will question that or sometimes they'll um the question whether or not you really can speak for ross you know but it, i think if you read about anybody enough or study anybody enough you get a mm -hmm. you get a you're impressed by him to some degree i think he was I think he was a real gentleman, first of all. I've seen, I have a film clip of him at one course, a Ron Amink. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he always dressed well, and even though he wasn't necessarily so well academically educated, you know, he just, he seemed, seemed to have the right upbringing by parents or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Ron, besides Donald Ross's uh, admirable personality, he was also productive and very, 
industrious in his practice, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, you know, the most sought after golf course architect really for maybe 20 years, I mean, plus or minus a few years one way or the other. But, um, you know, in nine, I have records of all the, all the courses he's credited with, with either building from scratch or rebuilding or, or, or working on a second and third time in some cases. But, um, you know, he's, he's credited with over 400 golf courses. And in 1920, he's credited with, with 20 golf courses, 20 golf course projects. In 1921, with 40 golf mm -hmm. course projects. Mm -hmm. In 1922, with uh, another 20. So really, in three years, he's credited with 80 projects, which, you know, at a time when people were traveling by automobile and rail, it was mm -hmm. really impossible. Today, it would be impossible, but yeah. there was a certain simplicity about the way he worked. He didn't, he didn't necessarily spend a lot of time there during construction, mm -hmm. just develop the drawings and field sketches and pass them on to, who, to, to a contractor he hoped was capable enough to pursue his work. Mm -hmm. In 1916, he, be he began to hire associates. He ended up with three associates, Walter Hatch, who, uh, who was in New England, in Amherst, New England, and uh, J.B. McGovern, who was in Wynwood, Pennsylvania, and Walter Irving Johnson, who lived in uh, Pinehurst and did most of his drawings. Oh, yeah. So there was kind of a much, much simpler way of doing things, and uh, his mission really was to spread the game. Mm -hmm. and, and he did. He did. Could we move a little bit forward in time now to 2003, your initial work here, the important major renovation of the Exmoor Golf Course. What do you remember about that year back in 2003? Everything, you know. <laughs> I remember everything, really. The, uh, did you see it as a great opportunity to really make something great? I did. I mean, I always, I'm always a little stumped when I first get to a golf course. Um, Sometimes they're beautifully maintained, you know, and um, it, it takes a little while to really see all the potential, but sometimes there are dozens of things that jump out the, within the first several hours that I see that, you know, where there are great opportunities to be things and other things that drastically need to be done. But, um, yeah, I, I, I remember almost every day everything that happened here, you know. And since then, what have been the most notable improvements that, that you've made? Well, I think we're gradually adding some fescues and native grasses on the golf course. I, um, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier up at the top of the stairs about um, the, the, the conversations I had with adding fescue along the entrance drive. Mm -hmm. People, you may have been part of that I was. committee, you know. And Back then I was. Trying to convince people that you know that they should get a feel for what this what Aronimink is that and I'm sorry what um, Exmoor is the minute they drive in the driveway you know yeah. and now and now they do and I'm proud of that and I want more of that I want more of that from where we're sitting I want to see more of that more long grasses yes I yeah. want to see more of the age and history and we heritage. originally were going to put them on either either side of this 18th fairway remember right, right. I want to I want to see more of that yeah but you know, the, the course hasn't strayed far from what my ambitions are. I don't think we've achieved everything. We have, a, we still have little details to take care of. Today, we were looking at widening some some of the fairways mm -hmm. considerably. You know, um, I, I, I think that I think they're a little narrower than I had initially anticipated, and we're hoping to take care of that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm happy. You know, I'm happy with the golf course. I'm still, I'm very excited and proud to be still involved. Uh, well, thank you for all your, your work. Thank Scott, you. I'll hand it to you. You talked about how many courses uh, and how prolific Donald Ross was in, uh, you know, during, uh, during his time. I'm just curious as to how many projects have you been sort of the lead architect, designer on over your career? I, I don't know exactly, but it's... It's somewhere close to a hundred, I guess, you know. And I worked for almost 17 years with other architects. So I was involved with lots and lots of golf courses at those times. Although, and I don't claim to be, you know, I, don't, I don't claim any part of that 
of their success. I just did what I was supposed to do, hopefully, and managed the construction and did a lot of the design work for several other architects. But mo most of my work has been restoration. And we're, we're restoring, I, I, I don't know the exact number right now, but probably seven or eight different courses we're involved with in Canada and back around, across, from Florida to Duluth, Minnesota, to Chicago and up in New England. So of, of let's say those hundred projects that you've been involved with or all of those restorations that you have undertaken similar to what you've done here at Exmoor, how does the one restoration here at Exmoor differ from the others that you've been involved with? How does the Exmoor renovation stand apart from the others? Well, I think every one of them has its own individual personality, you know, and people have asked me which is my favorite, and I, I probably have certain favorite holes, you know, but um, this is just really a good solid result, and, and it, it all has to do with Ross, you know, and um, the, some of his golf courses, the land was extremely difficult to work with, and I won't name them, you know, but so there's no way I could be as satisfied with the final result as I am with Exmoor. And, and it's just a matter of uh, the golf course was kind of shoehorned on a piece of ground that wasn't big enough or had way too much slope. One course, um, one course I restored it, and I, of course, we don't want to name it, but the entire golf course is built on a hill, you know, on a hillside. And so everything slopes in, in basically from... from uh, south to north, you know, on the entire piece of property. So uh, it was a difficult piece of property to work with, and all I can do is hopefully honor Ross's intentions as best I can, and you know, but it's not as satisfying. I, I was telling somebody today that one of the really great experiences I had was when we were restoring this golf course was just walking down the 18th hole, which is right here, during restoration, and we were doing a lot of dramatic work on the on the green surrounds here. There was some bunkering behind the green that we removed. We cut around, we, we, we cut a lot of the earth away behind the green so we could separate the putting surface from the hillside. And we deepened the bunkers on the, on the right and left side and squared the fill pad up. And um, it was about late at night in the fall and the moon was coming up over the clubhouse here. And it was pretty dark, but it was just, just probably you know one of the prettiest pictures I've, I've ever seen on a golf course, you know. So, um, as I said before, I mean, the one thing you have that that, that definitely separates your, you from a lot of the golf courses in this area is just the size of the piece of property, and consequently, you know, the golf course can be longer and stronger. Can you tell me what? you believe are the most distinguishing features or qualities of these courses you've been involved with? Um, like Evanston Golf Club, what do you think is the most distinguishing feature or quality of that golf course? Well, Evanston was a real challenge. I mean, it was just as, as flat as a table, the golf course, and, and the drainage was terrible. And I'm really proud of it because we put several miles of pipe under that golf course to carry water, you know, from the surface down into a system of pipes and get it off the property. So, I mean, I'm really I'm proud of the of the mechanics, the infrastructure of the golf course a lot. And and one of the things, one of the things I I really I think I, I focus on as much as anything with any golf course I, is is obviously I want to do the architect, you know, the give work correct in a fashion that respects his original intentions. Um, but at, at Exmoor and, and, and some of the other clubs that I worked at, probably all the other clubs, and Evans is a good example because I, they had a great clubhouse, and this is an incredible clubhouse. I mean, all of the, all of the facilities you have with the tennis and the, and the curling rink and this clubhouse is, part, is pretty unique if you really visit a lot of the other clubs in the area. Um, I felt there was an imbalance between, between, you know, the beauty and the strength of, the, of all these facilities 
in comparison to the golf course. And the golf course was kind of old and worn out, you know. And so, I mean, I have told other clubs that we just finished a club in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I've told them the same thing that, you know, one of my goals, I have a couple goals. One of them is to balance the golf course. So it has, it has this is what pumps the blood through a country club in the final analysis. You know, but I wanted it to really match the quality of the great clubhouse. Um, the other thing I really, the other thing that's really important to me is, 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 is to build the pride within the membership for their golf course. And, you know, I, I'm not saying this is any different than any, any other club I worked at, but there's an incredible um, hospitality here. Uh, the members have always been so respectful, it almost makes me emotional when I say it. I mean, they treated, I, I always tell, tell the superintendent, I mean, the, the general manager at Charlotte Country Club, I don't know how I got through the screening, you know, but um, somehow um, people have been, just are so kind to me, you know, and they express their appreciation. And it doesn't matter how much money you make, really, in the final analysis, you know. I mean, the, the friendships you make, I, I'm a trillionaire with the friendships I've made. And, you know, when people appreciate the work you do, you know, there's, there's no greater reward. Uh, I have so much fun with the different memberships and the committees, you know, and I tell them when I work with them, I say this is going to be one of the best experiences of your life. It'll be a lot of fun and you'll never, you'll never look at, a, at, a, at another golf course through the same eyes that you are today because you're going to learn a lot. You're going to learn a lot about the game and architecture and, you know, that's, I, and I believe they do, you know, I think you've heard me say some of those things, Don, you know. Ron, let me uh, let me ask you about just a couple of other clubs. I'm I'm curious about in terms of distinguishing features and characteristics. Skokie Country Club. Skokie was fun to work on in a way because it was an old Bendelow golf course, and and then they had Langford and, and then they had Donald Ross come in around 1916 and and do a lot of work on the golf course, and then they they bought more property and stretched the golf course. And they had a team of architects named Langford and Moreau, who, were, who have done some really nice work in the Midwest, come to Skokie and do, do some work. But on the, on the original routing plan of, of, uh, of Skokie, not the original routing plan, but the routing plan that Langford and Moreau produced, you could see clearly whose architect was, which holes were which architect that they retained. And they showed a lot of respect for Ross, and they showed respect for Bendelow, just only one hole left is really a Bendelow green and so forth. Um, you know, just, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great experience. Again, members were great and Don Cross, the superintendent, was outstanding to work with. So I'm happy and we're still, we're still working away, removing more trees. This course I talked to in Texas today, Houston, Texas, that I've been with, involved with for a long time. We, we're gonna do a lot of work next year, regrassing fairways and things. And I, there were some tr uh, turf grass experts on, on on this conference call would be talking about the the need to remove trees being the most the key to them getting better fairways. You know, so sometimes those are uphill battles you, you wage. But so it's hard for me to pick out a a particular thing about Skokie. You know. Okay, um, I only have two more questions and. The there's a little bit of a pre-ramble with both of them, so just bear with me here a little bit. Um, because of the original design and results of your restoration of, of this great golf course, Exmoor is ranked among the top 25 courses in the state of Illinois by Golf Digest, so Good. congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, if you were going to host a foursome <coughs> to play the course for their very first time, what would you tell your guests about the course to get them really excited to play it? I would tell them that, you know, they'll remember every hole when they leave the golf course. I think, I think they will, you know. I think now it's, it's, it's very, very memorable golf course. And every hole has its own special personality. And that's to the credit of Donald Ross, you know, more than me. But, 
in particular that. I, but, but really, I was looking around today at things, and I, I took a couple of photographs that I'll probably put online and so forth. But um, you know, I was just saying that one of my associates is here, Tyler Ray, who's working with me, and I was saying, you know, this is really a beautiful golf course. I looked at, and I can remember that what we did to improve it, you know, and so. I think that I think the the whole experience here is going to be an extraordinary day if I brought a foursome. By the way, the, the Donald Ross Society, I think it's the Ross Society, is going to be here in, in a month and a half, and they're playing here and Beverly and Skokie and uh, Evanston. You know, so. So let me ask you a follow-up question to to that, and I'll just throw this out. It wasn't prepared, but it just came to mind. I was out here playing golf with. Uh, a member and one of the things that I've been doing a lot of is asking people how would they describe the golf course and all of that is in preparation for the sort of branding work that we're doing and the descriptive words that we're trying to come up with that accurately and emotionally describe the Exmoor experience if you will um, and I shared this with Don but uh, this member said you know uh, I really thought about it I, I asked him about it in the men's bar and then and then he thought more about it when he went home and he wrote me a very lengthy email and he says uh you know what i think exmoor is exmoor is a thinking man's golf course it's very strategic and if you think through hole by hole there's certain places where you literally need to hit the ball in order to have the best possible chance to score on that particular mm -hmm. hole mm -hmm. would you agree with that assessment or would you characterize it differently no i think it's a, i think it's a good traditional test of golf you know uh, I, I remember Shortly after we restored it, there was a lady here who won the club championship, and I, I don't remember her name. I think at the time she was in her mid-50s. And I heard the story of how she was saying after she won the championship, you know, that she, she felt it was, it was due to the fact that, that she's had to really change her game and think one shot at a time as she played, as she played the golf course. And that... You know, raw, I mean, raw, that's a tremendous compliment to Donald Ross, you know, because you do have to do that. And the golf course, if you play intelligently, it's, 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 a, it's really enjoyable and should be. But if, you, if you're not thinking and just, just swinging away wildly, every time you, every time you make a mistake, you, there's a price to pay. But if you just don't overestimate your capabilities and play within your capabilities, I think the golf course is terrific. And we're, we're not finished, you know. In 2018, Exmoor will host a PGA Tour event, the Constellation Senior Players Championship, one of five majors on the Senior Tour. And that'll be our very first professional tournament uh, that we host here at the club. Television coverage on the Golf Channel will feature a course description and narrative for the benefit of their viewers. For many, this will be the first time they have ever heard about Exmoor's golf course. If you could write the script for that feature, what characteristics of our course would you like to see highlighted? And what words would you use to describe the course to the viewers? Well, first of all, I, you know, I, six weeks ago, ago or so, I heard about the fact that, that it's the Senior Tour Championship. Senior Players Championship, Players one of championship five majors. Would be here, you know. And I mean, I was, I was thrilled. That's why I'm here today, because I, I was in Chicago within a week anyway, uh, doing some other work. And um, I talked to, to Justin Foley, the green chairman, and said I'd like to stop up and visit. And when I came, I, you know, in my mind, I wanted to look at it and just see what it would, how it would be prepared for that event. And, um, I met, I met afterwards with, with, with Justin and I said, you know, I think there are a lot of details that we really can do to, to make it a, a, a tremendous event for the, for the players, you know. And they'll carry on in the future for the membership enjoyment. So um, I think that basically it's going to challenge them the, the way you were talking about a few minutes ago where you've got to think your way around and play one shot at a you know just play it one shot at a time i think the greens are pretty exceptional there are a few a handful that have been rebuilt over the years and don't have as much personality as 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 the other 13 for example you know um so 
and, and really that's where Ross defended his golf courses anyway. Uh, you know, he sort of, he sort of, his perspective of golf was that it was two games in one. And one was the journey from tee to green. And then the other, the other great game was what, what you did or the challenge you faced on the putting surface. And so I, I don't think it's a golf course that's, that's um, you know, going to be going to be drive scores way up high. Uh, but I think they'll, um, I think they're going to enjoy it as just a really great old traditional test, you know. And to me, that's what I envision on the whole golf course. I want people from the minute they drive through those pillars out there to feel like I've stepped back in time. And the golf course I'm going to play today is a golf course that's a 1920s golf course. You know, that, that's, and, and, and I think, I, I wouldn't wish anything better on, them, on, on your guests or members. Reviewing all that you've told us today, uh, what aspects of our golf course today are, are the most representative of Donald Ross design principles? The bunkering is pretty great. Um, I talked about Willie Watson doing some of the bunkers that are in incredibly unique, uh, unlike, unlike the bunkering on any other Ross courses, and some we can see right here on, on 1 and 18 and 17, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the bunkering is bold and, and um, appropriately penal. And typical of Mr. Ross. Very much. You yes. know, and that was, obviously, that was one of my objectives when we did the restoration work. Um, I don't think there's really a breather, you know, on the golf course. I think every hole has its own special merits. 14 is not a long, a single shot hole, par three, but I think it's, the green is terrific. And, uh, you know, uh, even the 18 here, I, I, it's going to be a great spectator event, you know. It'd be fantastic here around yeah. 18. I'm excited, and, we, and some of the things we're doing now are, are, are things that are, will accommodate the players in an unusual way. We're not going to narrow up the fairways like they do at a, at a U.S. Open or anything. Give them plenty of room to play the ball off the tee and spray it a little bit left and right. But, you know, in order to play well, they're going to have to be on the right side of the, the correct side of the fairway to get to the pin mm -hmm. because the bunkers have been closed up enough. There's enough bunkering in the front. So, uh, I, I can't imagine them honestly um, not being not being thrilled, you know, with what they'll see. Obviously, the, the biggest factor is we need to f firm it up and keep it fast and prep it from an agronomic standpoint. But mm -hmm. Kurt can do that, and the U and the PGA will be here to uh, the Senior Tour will be here to make sure that you know that all those d uh, uh, T's are crossed and I's dotted. Okay. Uh, Ron, one final question. Uh, we've talked about the past and the present and a little bit about the immediate future. W what is your vision and hope for the Exmoor Golf Course 30, 40, 50 years from now? If we could all come back, God willing, what would you yeah. like it to be? Not too much different from what it is today. You know, I'd like us to... Um, there are things we're talking about. We, we're probably a little bit over-treed now because uh, they... They keep growing and getting bigger, so I'd like it to be a little bit, little, little, be able to breathe a little bit better. But I'd like some more uh, texture, you know, which which means more longer grasses, so that mm -hmm. um, it it adds an element of texture on the golf course. Um, I mean, these golf courses like this really are ageless, you know, and all you hope is that you just hope that in the future people don't come and think they've got to modernize it. Hire the latest young architect who's getting a lot of press. And when I started in restoration of golf courses, it really, it was not part of the lexicon. No one was talking about restoring golf courses. It was just something I felt needed to be done. I started my own company in 1983 and talked with some people that I had worked with previously, a guy named Putt Pierman in particular, who had run Jack Nicklaus's company early in uh, in, the early, in, the, in the early 80s, and um, I told him this is what I wanted to, I wanted, I wanted to focus in my career on restoring old golf courses that mm -hmm. had been changed, modernized, 